Okay. Uh, I hope uh, that everything is fine with you in these challenging days. Um, in the last lecture, we discussed mainly two view geometry. In particular, we discussed algorithm for calculating relations between two views, uh, such homography, essential metrics, fundamental metrics, etc. Um, as you will see later on the course, uh, the two-view geometry actually paves the way to the multi-view uh, structure promotion problem. And today we'll start first in formalizing uh, the structure promotion problem in a multi-view setting. Just a minute. Okay. So let's formalize the problem. <clears throat> we, we are given uh, image projections in the images like x1j, x2j, etc. <clears throat> Xij denotes the, the, the projection of sin point j, j in image i. And from this uh, measurements, you would like to determine the motion and the structure, which means that you'd like to recover the projection matrices and projection matrices and M 3D point. Okay. Um, let's continue. So uh, in order to uh, formalize this motion uh, structure for motion problem, uh, we need to define what is called the reprojection error. Actually, we discussed it, but I'm, I'm not sure we, we, we uh, formalize it uh, mathematically. So we have measurements, the projection in the images, denoted here like x. <clears throat> and actually, I would like to solve for p and the x, where x is the uh, coordinate in the 3D space, p is the camera. In order to do that, we would like that um, the distance between the measured projected point and the projection after the recovery will be small as we can, which means that we'd like to have that the distance between the x coordinate and the projection in the x direction, or and also the y coordinate with relative to the projection in the y direction. This uh, kind of distance squared will be minimal as possible. And of course, we have it not just for one camera and one image. We have it for, as you see here, for many images and many projections. So if we uh, sum over the number of cameras and the number of, of views, like here, we have n projection matrices and n 3D views, sorry, 3D points. Sorry for that just i'm going to correct myself we have n cameras and, and m uh, uh, 3d points then we would like to have that the distance between the projected point like here what what we see here and the measured projected point like what we see here in the in the illustration will be small as possible and this objective is called the bundle adjustment objective I guess you already heard about it. And uh, this is actually the uh, formulation of the structural promotion problem. OK? <clears throat> the problem is that uh, this objective is very challenging, and it does not have any closed form solution. And in general, it requires relatively good initialization in order to uh, solve it by some iterative solver. Um, and uh, actually, in the next class, Amnon will cover these topics, the bundle adjustment topics, including the challenges and the ways to solve this uh, objective. This class is going to be uh, focused on uh, tools and theory of optimization in order that all of us will be on the same page with respect to optimization uh because the, this class and the other the two other next two classes are going to deal with optimization so uh this will be the main uh, uh topic of today any question before we start with the optimization review any questions no questions okay okay so uh what we are going to uh, uh review today 
So we had some motivation about optimization uh, because we understand that in order to solve the structural promotion problem, we need to solve the uh, bundle adjustment uh, optimization problem. We need to minimize the, this ch challenging objective that we just saw. So today I'll review uh, uh, optimization problem. We start with unconstrained optimization problem, and later on uh, in, uh, in the course, we are going to, to, to uh, cover also constrained optimization problem. Today we'll speak about convex optimization and uh, least square uh, problems. And uh, finally, we'll start to discuss line search method, including the gradient descent. We'll have some uh, uh, um, material that covers the convergence property of gradient descent. And then in the next class, in order to solve the bundle adjustment objective, I'm going to speak about Newton, gas Newton methods, and trust region method. Uh, specifically, Levenberg market method. So uh, let's start. So let's formalize uh, uh, what is an optimization pro problem. So standard optimization problem is formulated as, as, as the following. You would like to minimize some objective, which you call F0 of X, such that we have some constraints. The constraint constraint can be inequality constraint like here or equality constraint like here. You can have several inequality constraint and several equality constraint. The constraints here actually construct the, the set of constraint and we call it the feasible set. When you take into account all the constraint together, we call it the feasible set. It can uh, occur that the feasible set of course is empty uh, and the constraint and the, the constraint together does not share any any uh, element inside in this uh, respect we assume that the feasible set uh, is uh, uh, included is a subset of the domain of the objective function f0 and uh, we have the following cases um, we can uh, uh, we first uh, determine what is p star actually p star is the infimum of the objective over all the points in the feasible set okay so you look at the at the uh, smallest value only and on the set of constraint omega just there and you look for the minimal value of f0 if um, uh, the set is empty, if the feasible set is empty, we uh, say that P star is actually plus infinity. <clears throat> uh, the optim optimal set, uh, which we denote X opt, is all the axes such that X is in the feasible set and the objective attains the value of the optimal value, what we call P star, okay? Um, let's skip this uh, notation. Let's see some examples. Um, so this is the standard formulation of the optimization problem. As I said before, the problem might be non-feasible, which means that the constraints are uh, um, a, do, do not intersect and the feasible set is empty. Um, let's take another example. For example, uh, uh, the, the optimal value here for uh, one over x, okay, this is one over x, is actually uh, a p star is equal to zero, but the optimal value is not achieved because the function does not attain this optimal value. At the limit, we have the zero, but the function does not attain it, okay? Um, now, uh, another example, uh, the objective might be unbounded from below, which means that p star is minus infinity, like what we have here, here for example, uh, for uh, minus uh, log x. Um, do you understand why the feasible set can be empty? Anybody has an example? No, nobody?
Um, if the constraints contradict one another. For example, yeah. yeah. If the constraints contradict like, one another, for example, one of the constraints is the, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, something like uh, x uh, is bigger than zero and also x is smaller than zero. This is very simple example. Then the feasible set is actually empty. Okay. This is a good example. Okay. So let's move on. Today, we are going just to discuss a problem without constraint, what we call unconstrained optimization problem. Actually, we are going to minimize an objective over the domain of, of the function, no additional constraints, okay? Then later on, um, in, in the next uh, few lecture, we'll discuss also constraint optimization problem, okay? So, um, this is just for, for illustration. Generally, we would like to have a global, uh, <clears throat> to, to find the global uh, minimum, like here or like here. But as you know, it's not easy to find the global minimum because what we have at, at each, uh, what we have when we look at the function is just local information. We don't have the global landscape of the function. We have only just the local information. So even if we have the global minimizer, we are not sure that this is the global minimizer. So many algorithms would like very much to have the global minimizer, but are able to only to find some local minimizer. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll briefly uh, mention some uh, definitions that you are familiar with, and we'll have some uh, uh, proofs. Um, sorry if it seems like something from high school, but in order that everything is will, will be clear, uh, everything is going to be here uh, in this lecture. So uh, what is a global minimizer? A global minimizer is such that, of a function is such that uh, uh, x star is a global minimizer if the value of x star is smaller or equal uh, than other values for all x in the, of the function. What is a local minimizer? A local minimizer uh, is such that if there's a neighborhood B, B x star, where B x star is an open set that contains x star, such that in this neighborhood, uh, the value of at x star is smaller than the other values. We have also a strict local minimizer. Uh, so x star is a strict local minimizer. If there is a neighborhood B x star such that f x star is strictly smaller than the values in this neighborhood. So here in the diagram, what is global, what is local, what is strict? Anybody would like to say something? A global x and local, but and x one and x two are not strict. Right. Good. So we have a, a global uh, minimizer, local minimizer, and here x one till x two are all of them are uh, minimizers, but they are not strict. Right. Okay. Let's move on. <clears throat> So let's uh, uh, review uh, some uh, uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for a minimizer. So the first order necessary condition, uh, which all of us are familiar with, is that if x star is local minimizer of f and f is continuously differentiable in an open neighborhood of x star, then the gradients vanishes. We'll have the proof in the next slide. Um, um, so, Actually, all of us know that what is a stationary point? A stationary point is such that the gradient, the gradient is equal to zero. So actually, the stationary points are the superset of the local minimizer. Any local minimizer is a stationary point, okay? We have also the second order uh, necessary conditions. Uh, X star is a, a local minimizer of F. And the, the um, um, Hessian is continuous in open neighborhood of X star, then the gradient vanishes, and uh, the Hessian at this point is, uh, 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 how to say, is, uh, is, a PSD fun, is a PSD matrix, positive, uh, positive semi definite matrix. Um, this is a necessary condition. Anybody uh, has an idea about function 
even in 1D, such that satisfy the necessary condition, but does not have a local minimizer? Anybody has an idea? I guess you are familiar with it from high school. One over X. One over X. Where does it uh, obey the necessary conditions? So actually, if you think about x to the x to the third, okay, at x equal to zero, we have that the gradation vanishes and the second uh, uh, derivative is also zero, but uh, uh, we don't have there a local minimizer at uh, x equal uh, zero for the function x to the power of uh, three. Okay, this is this is just to say that this is a necessary condition and not sufficient condition. Okay. We'll have soon the sufficient condition also, okay? So um, anybody has an idea how to prove that uh, X star, if X star is a local minimizer, then the gradient vanishes? So I'll, I'll give you a hint. Let's suppose that it does not vanishes, okay? And we denote by uh, P uh, minus the gradient of F at X star. And uh, under this uh, uh, assumption, it turns out that P transpose times the gradients of F at X star is actually smaller than zero, okay? But here we assume that F uh, uh, is continuously, continuously differentiable. Therefore, since the gradient is continuous near X star, we can assume that uh, there is some uh, interval for which uh, the function P transpose uh, times the gradient of F at X plus TP is smaller than, than zero. Due to the continuity, the function behave like it behaves here, okay? Therefore, we can now take the, the Taylor theorem and say that for any T bar in this interval, we can get the Taylor expansion which means that at x star plus t bar times p, we have this expansion at x, uh, at x star plus t bar times p transpose the gradient at x star plus t, where t is somewhere in the interval between 0 and t bar, okay? And therefore, it turns out, due to this assumption, right, that it's smaller than 0, that this... Uh, uh, part, this, uh, this uh, uh, element is going to be smaller than zero, and therefore this value is smaller than this value. There is, therefore, there is, there is direction leading away from X star along which F decreases, so X star is not a local minimizer, and this contradicts the assumption that the gradient does not vanish. Okay, I, I know it's uh, trivial, but just to to be sure that all of us understand the situation. Um, okay, now we have sufficient conditions for a, 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 a local minimizer. Actually, we have, we have even something which is stronger than what we need. So if uh, the Hessian is continuous in a neighborhood of uh, X star and the gradient vanishes at X star and we have strictly positive definite metric, Hessian matrix at X star, then X star is a strict local minimizer, okay? All right, um, so just examples. Uh, we ha when we have uh, X squared and we have uh, the gradient vanishes and the uh, F double prime at zero is greater than zero, by this sufficient condition, we know that at X equals zero, we have a strict local minimizer in the case of X squared. But there are some other cases that uh, we discussed before for example, here um, we have something which is not differentiable and we, strict, we still have a strict local minimizer. Uh, we discussed before fx equal x uh, uh, <coughs> to the cube. And here, for example, fx equal x to the fourth. And we have a strict local minimizer, but it does not obey the sufficient condition. So just uh, be sure that uh, um, uh, this is not necessary and sufficient. We have cases from this side and this side, okay? 
Um, okay, let's move on. So uh, we understand that uh, we'd like very much to have the global minimizer at each function, like what we would like to have here. Okay, but of course we have uh, many local minimizers in, in function, which is uh, just a general function, which is not convex. However, um, uh, in a general function, a local minimum is not necessarily a, a global minimum, but in the case of convex function, and we'll show it, um, any local minimum is a global minimum. And also uh, the, uh, the vanishing of the gradient is a necessary and sufficient condition. It means that if the gradient is zero, f attains its global minimum at x star, okay? This is the case of a convex function and everybody will be uh, proved later on in the course. Um, so now we are going to move on to uh, uh, some uh, review about convex theory. Uh, we start with the convex sets and affine sets and we'll see some geometric and algebraic properties and some nice operations that preserve convex set, and then we'll move on to other interesting things that related to convex function and uh, line search method. Just to be, I'm, I'm curious to, to understand how many of you are familiar with uh, convex set and in particular alpha sets. Can you please reply? Okay, no answer. Okay, um, uh, let's move on. Okay, so uh, let's uh, define what, what is convex set. Uh, a set is convex if for any uh, elements in the set and theta between zero and one, it turns out that theta x plus one plus y minus theta x two uh, belongs to the set. Uh, this is equivalent to the uh, notion that a set is convex if and only if the line segment between any two points in the set lies in the set. So it's clear that this is a convex set and this is not a convex set. And what about this? Is this a convex set? Yes. No. Why yes, but why no? No, because in the boundary, there I can take two, two points, and the bit in between we're not going to be inside the. Right, right. The, this is the problem because here we can take the two points and take the line segment between them, and they are not in the set. Okay, so this is not a convex set. And this is not a convex set, and this is a convex set. Okay, let's move on. Um, now we are going to describe uh, what are uh, lines and line segment and affine set. So uh, line through two points in Rn are all the points which can be written as theta x1 plus minus 2 at x2. Theta can be any number between, uh, any number, not just between 0 and 1. In this, in this construct, the line passing through x1 and x2, like here. Okay, just a way to write a, a line between two general points in, the, in Rn. Okay, and when we speak about line segment between x1 and x2, we mean that all the points between x1 and x2 such that theta should be restricted to 0, 1. Okay, and this looks like uh, the following situation. Uh, we can actually, we can write the line through x1 and x2, but by x2 times some parameter theta times the vector x1 my, minus x2, like what you see here, okay? So this is the point, and this is another uh, uh, vector or point, and we can write the line like, like here, okay? Um, and uh, when we speak about the segment, we speak about theta between zero and one, like what we see here, okay? Okay, 
Um, what, are, what are affine set? Um, so an, a set is affine if, an on, if, if for any two points in the set, and uh, theta, any number, the line between them resides in the set, okay? Which is equivalent to, to saying that a set is affine if the line through any two points in the set line in the set, lies in the set, okay? Um, what is an affine combination? An affine combination of points uh, generalizes uh, the case when uh, other th than looking at two points, which means that uh, uh, an affine combination of points uh, is uh, when we take m points and we take uh, weights such that the sum of the weight is one, uh, then the affine combination is the su sum of um, a, the points weighted by the weights. This is the affine combination. And actually, a set is affine if and only if it contains every affine combination of its points. Moreover, the intersection of an arbitrary collection of affine sets is also an affine set. It's closed out under the affine set, OK? Mirab, how is a convex combination different from a affine set? OK, good uh, question, good question. Um, in the convex combination, OK? Convex set, I mean, convex set. OK, good question, good question. So uh, it's, it's uh, I'm going to, uh, to, we spoke so far about alpha set, and we spoke in the beginning about a uh, convex set, right? So in the convex set, you see the constraint here, theta should be between 0 and 1, OK? A convex combination or convex set uh, is the definition that any two points, the, the line segment between any two points should reside in the set, OK? In the affine set, the line between, not the line segment, the line between any two points should reside in the set, which means that when we speak on the convex set, the weights should be between 0 and 1. When we speak about the affine set, the weight can be any number such that the sum of the weight is sum to one. Is this clear? So an affine set is, must be a inf infinite? An affine set is always a convex set. A convex set is not always an affine set. OK? Good question, and thanks for uh, I just meant to say it now. Um, maybe later, not now, okay. Um, um, okay, actually the affine sets are something that are, all, of, all of us are familiar with. Actually, what are affine sets? Affine sets are sub shifted subspaces. Um, what, what I mean by that? Um, this is one of the theorem that says that the subspaces of Rn are the affine sets which contain the origin. Actually, it's the same. <clears throat> and affine sets are general in the sense that can take the subspace and shift it and get an affine set. That's all the idea between the affine sets, OK? So le let's first uh, prove, uh, prove this theorem. So let's show that every subspace is actually uh, an affine set, OK? So every subspace contains uh, the 0 and therefore the origin. And since it closed under addition and scalar multiplication, is it in particular an affine set? So this direction is easy. Let's do the other direction. Let's take the affine set and we, that contains the origin and show that it is the subspace of Rn. So if C is an affine set that contains the origin, then for any x in C and theta in R, we have that theta x by definition of the affine, uh, affine set which is actually y minus theta times a, a zero plus theta x, therefore theta x belongs to C. So it's closed under uh, scalar multiplication. That's what we need in order to show that uh, uh, we have a, a subspace. Now we, are, we need to show that the, subset, th that the set is closed under addition, okay? So it's already we saw that it's closed under scalar multiplication, now it's closed under addition. So if we take x and c and y and c, and uh, we look at uh, one half of x plus y, we can write it immediately like this, okay? And this belongs to the set, 
Why does it belong to the set? It belongs to the set by the definition of the affine set. And we already shown, showed that uh, it's closed under multiplication. So I can multiply it by two. And then I have that x plus y also belongs to C. So the affine set, which contains the zero, is closed under scalar multiplication and under addition. Therefore, it's a subspace uh, of Rn. OK? So actually, affine set, which contain the origin, and subspaces Rn are the same. So let's now understand what are affine set which do not contain the origin. OK? So if C is an affine set, and we have some point which belongs to C, then we would like to show what complement what we think what that complement what we have before that the uh, the set v which is c minus x zero okay uh, let's take each x and subtract x zero is a subspace okay that's what we want to show so what we need to show in order to show that v is a subspace i'm sure you know it same thing as before the same thing as before that we have the zero element and the v is closed under addition and a scalar multiplication so clearly v contains zero now we show that it's closed under addition scalar multiplication so we have two elements in v and alpha and beta in r um, uh, by definition v1 plus x0 is in c and v2 plus x0 is also in c by the definition of of the of v okay now i'll take a, a alpha times v1 beta times v2 plus x0 uh, and we write we can write rewrite it as alpha uh, plus v1 plus x0 v2 plus x0 plus one minus alpha minus one beta x0 i didn't change anything um and all of this combination belongs to C, since C is an affine set, and the sum of the weights is actually exactly one. So if this element is C, we know by definition that alpha 1 plus beta v2 is going to be in V. Hence, V is closed under addition and scalar multiplication and contains the origin. Therefore, V is a subspace. OK? Good. Uh, let's see some graphical example. Um, so the corollary is that affine set can be expressed always as subspace in Rn plus an offset. And the offset is actually a point that belongs to the affine set C, OK? Like what we see here. What we see here, OK? Uh, here we have a subspace, one-dimensional subspace, okay, which contains the origin. All of these blue lines are actually affine sets, which are uh, v plus some uh, shift, okay, v plus uh, one shift, v plus as other shift. All of these are uh, affine set, and actually we call v the red line. Uh, the corresponding subspace of the affine set. Is this clear? Are yes. We, okay. I'll really be happy to hear you because I'm feeling that I'm speaking and uh, I hope every, everybody is listening. Okay. So if we have uh, the notion that every affine set can be expressed as a subspace plus some offset, we can speak about dimension. So the dimension of the affine set is defined as the dimension of its the associated subspace, which is C minus X0. X0 is element in C. So let's see some example. Um, the dimension of the empty set is minus 1. This is a convention. For a single tone, it's 0. For a line, it's 1. Plane 2, Rn, n. Very, very uh, intuitive. Um, actually, what I would like to show here uh, is something which is very uh, uh, convenient to, to understand and to, to know is that any affine set, and maybe intuitive it's clear, can be written as 
uh, linear system of equations, okay? And vice versa. Any R system of equations is an alpha and set. So this is equivalent notions. Uh, this is very helpful. Later on, you will see why. So let's start from the easy part. Let's show that uh, uh, <clears throat> if this is the set, all the elements in Rn which obey a x equal to b, okay? A is not necessarily square. It can be rectangular, everything. A is order is size of m times n. B is uh, belongs to Rm. So if x belongs to m and y belongs to m and theta in R, then we'll take A times the element, uh, theta x plus minus theta y. We would like to show that this new element is also belongs to m, which means that obeys a x equal to b, and by linearity, we already know, we, we all know that we can take theta out and minus theta out. This is b, this is b, and we get immediately b. So this is an alpha set. This is the easy easy direction. The other direction, <clears throat> let's take an arbitrary alpha set, okay? Um, and let L be the subspace associated to M, such that M equal to L plus X0, where X0 belongs to M. Now, what we are going to do, we are going to find a basis uh, to determine L, okay? Because L is a subspace, you can find a basis. <clears throat> it's easy, easy to uh, say the following. Let uh, A1 to A and B, the basis of L uh, perpendicular, then it's clear that we can write L as the uh, perpendicular of L perpendicular, which is actually all the vectors such that uh, are perpendicular to A1 through AM, okay? And in a shorthand, if we take this, all these vectors and put in, in them in rows like here, like what we have here, we can say that L is actually all the y's such that a y is equal to zero, right? Is this clear? No. Not? Okay. Who'd say no because I don't see? Michael. Michael, okay. So first of all, is it clear that M can be decoupled to subspace plus shift? Yes. Is this clear? Okay. Now I would like to describe L. L is a subspace. Okay. So I'm going to uh, have a basis for L star. Sorry, for L, which is perpendicular, is the uh, the, vector, the the subspace which is uh, perpendicular to L. Okay. So I, have, I, I construct a basis with M elements. Okay, to the L perpendicular. Okay, then what is L? L is all the vector that are perpendicular to the basis of L perpendicular. That's what is written here. Okay. Yes. And then in in shorthand, if I want to write it, I can take all the AIs, put them in the rows of a matrix A, and say that L is actually all the y such that a y equals to zero. Okay? Yes. Okay, good. Now, what is m? m is l plus x zero. So it's all the y plus x zero that l y equal to zero. Or in other words, it's all x such that a times x minus x equal to zero. Just rename. Uh, the y plus x zero by x, which means it's all x that such that a is equal to b, where b is actually a of x zero. So I started from an alpha set and I moved to m, which is actually all the x's that at a x equal to b. And actually, what is l? Anybody has an idea how to call l? Wait, Mirav, x0 is a scalar or a vector? I a vector. Lost it. x0 is a vector which belongs to m. Okay. 
B is, a scale, is, is also a vector which is A times X0. Like what you see, X0 is, is, belongs to M. You see, it's an element in M. Yeah, okay. But now I'm asking any intuition, what is L actually? Isn't it the null space of uh, M? Great. Great. L is the null space of the matrix uh, A. Okay? The, of, the, of the good. Of a, a, L is exactly the null space of the matrix A. Um, so to conclude, if I have an affine, affine set in Rm, I can take an element in the affine set. M and I can take a, a subspace plus this, this element. This subspace actually can be the null space of a system of equations, uh, which I call AX equal B, which was constructed by looking at the perpendicular subspace L uh, to, to L. And here, I think it's very odd. Oh, something is okay. So every affine set, I hope everything here will be clear. Every affine set can be written as x such that ax equal to b, some linear system of equations, where actually m is the null space of a, the l what we had before, plus x0, where a x0 equal to b. And the dimension of M, of course, would be the dimension of the null space, as we said before. The dimension of the affine set is the dimension of the subspace which, which is associated to. Here it's N minus M. And actually, as we saw before in the construction, uh, the vector A is going to be uh, the normal vector to the, uh, to the null space and of course, also to the uh, 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 <coughs> alpha uh, set, which are comprised of the subspace. Okay, like what we see here. This is exactly the A that we put in a matrix before. This is just one dimension, but this is exactly what we had before. So, any question? Okay, is it clear? Can we move on? Okay, so we, we concluded with an affine set. You know, I would like to say the following that just Jana, Dana asked in the beginning. So convex sets are more general than affine sets. All affine sets are convex sets. Since any affine set is convex, since it contain the, contains the entire line between any two points, and therefore it contains the line segment between any two points, therefore it's, it's convex. The other direction, of course, is not true. Um, so we spoke before, just before I'm moving on. Uh, time, just a minute. Okay, L let's move on and take a, a break in a few minutes. <clears throat> so we spoke before about convex combination, sorry, often combination, and now we spoke about convex combination. Actually, convex combination of a points x1, xm is a point such that we take the weights theta1 to theta m. The sum of the weights is going to be 1, but theta i should be non negative. This is as opposed to what we had, had in the affine set. The theta i can be take any number such that the sum is 1. Okay? So, this is a, a, a convex combination. And actually, a set is convex if and only if it contains all the convex combination of its element. And also, we have the idea of convex hull. The set of all convex combination of point in C uh, actually uh, is called the convex hull. So here, for example, we have some points in R2. And this is the convex hull in uh, R2. And the convex hull has give uh, or, or, or achieves a, a convex set. For example, if this is a set, okay, and this is this the convex hull of the set, and actually the convex hull is the smaller convex set that contains the original set C, in a sense that any if C is any convex set which contains C, then uh, the convex hull of C 
is contained in S. Okay, this is the smallest uh, uh, convex set which contains the original set. Okay. Um, some properties of convex set, this is very, very important to, uh, to know and to understand and to use. Um, so um, if we have elements in a convex set C, then any uh, infinite summation, weighted infinite summation of uh, weighted convex combination, infinite summation is still in C. Uh, okay, if it converges, every, uh, everything can be also done if we move from the sum to the integral. Um, a convex set should, should be connected. Uh, the intersection of convex set is convex. This is very important to understand uh, and to know that when we take a few convex sets and we look at the intersection of them, it's always going to be convex. It's very easy to show from the definition of convex set. Also, the closure of a convex set is, co is convex. The interior of a convex set is convex. And there are some uh, algebraic rules that you can uh, do. For example, you can take two convex sets, S and T, multiply by scalar uh, convex set. You still get a convex set. And you, or you take both elements we take element for both uh, from both sets S and T and add them and take all the element, you get a convex set. Part of this are going to be proved today in the lecture, and part of this you are going to have maybe as some ho homework. And part of this just you can look uh, later uh, yourself. <clears throat> and uh, I'll I'll suggest that we'll have a break till 10 past 10, okay? And then we'll move to uh, what we are all familiar with, to Alphan transformation, and to see how does it relate it to convex set, to Alphan, Alphan set, et cetera, et cetera. And, okay, so let's do eight minute breaks, okay? And come back at 10 past 10. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> we're going to speak about alpha transformation. We already saw alpha transformation in the beginning, beginning of the course. Actually, uh, an alpha transformation is a transformation such that uh, uh, t times lambda x plus y minus, y minus lambda y for any lambda is actually lambda tx plus y minus lambda ty for any lambda and xy in uh, Rn. The nice uh, observation is that that uh, any often transformation actually can be written as some uh, linear transformation plus uh, plus b plus uh, plus vector. Okay, so here you have the proof. I'm not going to prove it because it takes time and it's not very complicated. You will have it in the slides, and we'll move on. Um, so I'm sure that you're familiar with it. So let's move on. So an alpha transformation is, general, is, is actually a generalization of linear transformation. It's linear transformation plus some shift, okay? And, and we'll see, in a minute, you will see why it's important to understand in, with respect to convex optimization. So uh, we know what is alpha transformation, sorry. Uh, okay. What does alpha transformation do? It scales, it translates, it reflects, it rotates like what we have here we have some triangle and it's skewed like this using this alpha transformation okay the nice idea that we have to understand is the following that actually if you take a convex set and you uh, uh, uh take the alpha image of the convex set you'll still have a convex set okay this is very very important to know it's very useful uh, so this is the proof. If I have a convex set and I have uh, a mapping, a fine mapping, Ax plus B, I would like to show that also the mapping of the set C is a convex set, OK? So how we are going to do it? We are going to take two elements in Fc, which means that if we take two elements in Fc, it means that uh, there exists two elements in the original set C such that Ux will do 
the mapping AX plus B, V equal to AY plus B. Now we take theta between zero and one. We would like to show that theta U plus Y minus theta V actually belong to the mapping, to the FC. So theta U plus Y minus theta V can be written using the mapping, what we have here, theta times AX plus B, minus theta Y plus B. Then we uh, take into account the linearity of A and we take can take gather the elements and take inside a so a times this element plus b since <clears throat> we know that uh, c is convex then we know that theta x plus y minus theta y is also in c because x and y in c therefore we have a new element which we call z which resides in c such that uh, uh, a, a, it can be written as a z plus b therefore it's the mapping of Z, and therefore it belongs to the mapping of C. Okay? Is this clear? It's very useful. And moreover, there, are, there is another direction that if you have a convex set, C, and you look at the inverse Affan image of the convex set, if F is an is a Affan mapping, what uh, we denote but F minus 1 of C, it doesn't relate to any inverse of function or something like this. You just say that if you have a set C and you have a mapping F, all the element X which have a mapping C are construct a new set which also convex. Okay. So uh, I remembered it. It's very useful, and we'll see in a minute. We'll see how and why. So uh, here are some simple examples, and later on we'll have more complicated example. So. Um, First of all, um, let's take two uh, set, S1 and S2. I, I want to show you some examples. And I want to show that S plan, S1 plus S2 is indeed a convex set, such that one element is taken from S1, the other element is taken from S2. <clears throat> but first of all, in order to show it, uh, we can show that the Cartesian product, S1 times S2, is also a convex set. And this is easy to show using the definition of convex set here i'm going to skip it now since this one is a convex set now i can take some linear function fx1 x2 and say that it's x1 plus x2 therefore we can get the, the set s1 plus s2 and due to the idea that uh, we started from some convex set and made some often mapping on the convex set, we can get a new set which is a convex set. Is this clear? Although I... Okay. Um, simple example, again, scanning of a set, translation of a set, all of them are often mapping of a convex set and therefore are convex set. Also projection, it's an, it's an often mapping, uh, of a convex set and, and, all, and therefore uh, it's a, co a convex set. So you take a set which is convex and you take the projection in some, uh, 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 for example, to RM, then you get a convex set. Okay? Let's move on. Let's move to convex functions. So, uh, <clears throat> so far we discussed convex sets. Now we are going to move to convex functions. Uh, as first of all, function is convex is first of all the domain which is defined on it is a convex set like what is written here you cannot separate the definition of convex function and the domain of the convex function so if the domain of the function is convex and it satisfies that each two element in the domain and for each theta between zero and one uh, the uh, function over this combination, okay, or this convex combination is smaller than a theta times fx plus minus theta times fy, then we have a convex function. What does it mean geometrically? I take two points, like here, x and the value of at x, y and the value at y, and I'll take the chord above the function. If all elements of the function are below this line then this function is going to be a convex function okay <clears throat> uh, 
um, a function is going to be strictly convex function if again if domain domain of the set is convex and if actually um, any two elements which are not identical obeys the uh, strict inequality not just uh, uh, not just what we had before okay convex function is concave if minus f is concave and here we have an example we have an affine function an affine function is uh, a convex function because it obeys this and of course it obeys uh, smaller or equal to and actually uh, affine function is convex and concave because you can multiply by minus from both sides and actually you can get that affine function is convex and concave and essentially it can be shown that any function that is convex and concave is going to be an affine function <clears throat> <clears throat> now, uh, how are we are going to check convexity of a function? We can check by definition. Uh, we can take the function and restrict it to a line and check uh, the convexity on the line. We are not going to do it. And we can use very nice property which are called first order condition and second order condition. And then we can use some tricks of algebra to understand where where uh, if function is convex or not <clears throat> so what is the first order condition for a convex function uh this is a very very nice uh, property uh, it's even of only if <clears throat> so under the assumption that uh, the domain of the function is convex and uh, f is differenti differentiable in an open uh, an open uh, domain and then we have that the function f is convex if and only if for any x and y in the domain the value of f at y is greater or equal to fx plus the inner product between the gradient at x and y minus x um, like what we see here in the drawing okay and this is true for any point in the domain um can somebody tell me what is exactly the right hand side here any idea what we have on the right hand side here what is this i'm sure you know First order of expansion. a tail of expansion great this is a tail expansion great um uh, about x for the point y right and actually uh the idea is that what we have for a convex function and this is if and only if is the following we have something which is very nice it turns out that for a convex function the first order Taylor approximation of f is global underestimator it's always smaller than the value of the function it does not cross the function okay and on the other side if the first order tail approximation of function is always a global underestimator it does not cross the function at any point then the function is convex and this is very nice because it says the following we can take some local information about the convex function which is the function itself and the derivative at the point and we get global information, which is a global underestimator. And now, what we can say, we can say that if the gradient is equal to zero, okay, then we have immediately by this uh, relation that the value at any point is greater or equal to the value at x. And therefore, x a global minimizer. So from the first order uh, condition, we see immediately that if we have a convex function, the vanishing of the gradient is necessary and sufficient condition for, for global minimizer. And this is the beauty of convex function. And therefore they are so uh, uh, attracted uh, 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 to have such, such function and to formulate things which have a convex function.
So we see here what we claimed in the beginning of the lecture, that the uh, vanishing of the gradient in the case of convex function is <clears throat> a necessary and sufficient condition for global minimizer. OK? I hope it's clear. <clears throat> then we have the second order condition, which says that f is convex if and only if the Hessian uh, of, of f at each point in the domain, C, which is a convex domain, uh, is positive semi positive semi-definite uh, uh, matrix, okay? Which means that all the eigenvalues are non-negative, for example. This is just equivalent uh, definition. Here we have some example. Let's see, for example, uh, minus log x. If I differentiate it twice, uh, <clears throat> I get that, uh, um, just a minute, something is not sure. I think it should be without the minus. Sorry, it's a, it's a mistake here. If uh, I differentiate it twice, then uh, I'll have uh, something which is greater than zero. Uh, I mean, in the in the domain uh, which x uh, greater than zero, then minus log x is going to be a, a convex function. Also, the negative entropy x log x is also going to, to be a, a, a convex function since the second derivative is greater than zero. Um, we have also uh, x to the power of alpha for alpha greater than one and smaller than, or smaller than zero is also a convex function. In this domain, this is a concave function. Uh, actually, minus log x and x log x are strictly convex function. And here, here you have some uh, visualization for convex function and uh, again convex, concave, and non-convex function because uh, x to the power of p, when p is uh, where p is uh, uh, half, is not a convex function. Um, here, for example, we have one over x squared, and the second derivative is going to be. Uh, positive, but we still see that the convex function, the, the function is not convex. Because if I take a, a, a line, for, for example, from here to here, uh, the function is not above. So what happens here? Why, 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 what, what is the contradiction here? Again, the question is the following. I have the following function. OK, and this is the second derivative, which is greater than 0. But I still do not have a convex function. Maybe because the domain is not a convex. Exactly, state. exactly. This is the idea. The, just to say that the domain is going along with the function. The domain is not convex, OK? We, do, we, we don't have any uh, definition for the case where equal to 0. The function is convex in this side and convex in this side, but not across the sides. OK, very nice. OK, good. A um, few other examples. If I'll take the max function of uh, element x1 to xn, we can show that this is a convex function. Sorry that I'm skipping. This is important, so I'll, I'll speak about it. Any norm in Rn. Uh, where uh, p is greater than 1, and also p uh, it tends to infinity, like what we've written here, is a convex function. Why is it true? We take theta between 0 and 1, and we look at f theta x plus minus theta y. We would like to show uh, <coughs> that this is a convex function. I would like to show that this, is, this, this occurs. And uh, why, why does this occur? Because we, here we, we use the triangle inequality of uh, norms, and here we use the homogeneity of norms, OK, if f is norm. And therefore, we get that if f is the norm like this, then uh, it holds that we have uh, the uh, uh, convex property. It means that the norm of theta x plus y minus theta y is smaller than theta times the norm plus minus theta times the norm, OK? So any norm on Rn is a convex function. 
<clears throat> okay, like what we had in the case of the convex set, we have here in the case of the convex function, if we take uh, a function and we compose it with an affine mapping, mapping and the, the original function was convex, then the resulting function is also convex. What do I mean by that? I have a, a affine mapping, G, and uh, F is a convex function. Then F over the affine mapping, uh, which result in a new function GX, G is also going to be a convex function, where the domain of G is all the, the uh, elements in RM, such that AX plus B, the mapping of them, resides in the domain of F. Okay? Why this is true? First of all, why, why the domain of G is convex? It's written here, but we understand it. Why the domain of G is convex? Because the property that we had before, the domain of G is a convex set because it's an inverse image of a convex set under an affine mapping. I mean that domain of F is convex. Here we have an affine mapping, and therefore the resulting inverse image is also a convex set. So first of all, we see that the domain of <clears throat> the new function is convex. And then we can take uh, two elements in uh, the domain and theta between 0 and 1 and use the composition and use the idea that f is convex and we have an affine mapping. I'm sorry that I'm running. It's easy to see. And we can see that g of the convex combination is smaller than theta times g plus y minus theta times g at y. Okay, therefore g is convex. <coughs> okay, we'll see examples soon. Um, there are, this is just two examples. The, what we see before, the maximum over x and y is convex function, and also the infinity norm. What is written here on the right-hand side is a convex function, like what you see here. Okay. Just uh, another example, we have uh, uh, x squared over y when the domain of f is r times uh, the positive numbers. y could be only positive. Why is it convex? It's easy to show that if I'll take this function and I calculate the Hessian, that's what I get. And since it can be composed to this matrix, we know that uh, such a matrix is always PSD. Everybody know that such a matrix is always, always PSD? OK. So um, since the Hessian is non-negative, is, is, is a positive semi-definite uh, matrix in the domain, we get immediately that this function is a convex function, and it looks like this. This is the graph of this function. This is x, this is y, and this is the graph of uh, this function, quadratic over linear. Okay? <clears throat> okay. Um, any question before I'm moving to some another topic regarding a uh, least square and convex quadratic function? Would you like to ask to any question? I'll, happy, I'll be happy to have questions. Okay, so um, okay, we have uh, a, this definition, which is a convex quadratic function, which is half x transpose p x plus q transpose x plus r, where p is uh, p s d. Why this is a convex function? I would like to hear your voice. Any idea why this is a convex function? What is the Hessian of this uh, function? P. 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 And it is uh, semi-positive. So. Exactly. Since the Hessian of this function is exactly P, and P is a PSD, then this is a convex function. OK? This is actually if and only if. Because the second order condition is if and only if. If P is not PSD, this is not going to be a convex function. Okay? 
<clears throat> here we have what we all we are familiar with. Here we have a least square function, um, ax minus b uh, in the in the norm two squared, which is actually x transpose a transpose x minus two b transpose x plus some constant. Why this function is always convex? Any idea? Maybe because the Hessian here is A transpose A. Exactly. And is PSD. Exactly. The Hessian here is exactly A transpose A, and A transpose A always PSD. Therefore, it's always convex. <clears throat> In contrast to what we had before. Moreover, actually, any least square function can be written. It doesn't relate to convexity. Any, any least square function can be written as convex, uh, sorry, can be written as quadratic function, actually as convex quadratic function. But the other side is not true. If you take a quadratic function, it not always can be written as the least square function, okay? Um, actually, minimization of this function is equivalent to the minimization of this function. Can you please tell me why this function is convex? According to what we had just two slides, three slides before. Let's try to understand. First of all, this is a norm, right? It is a composition of convex functions. And the composition and alpha function, right. Composition of, of norm, which is a convex function with an alpha function, right? So therefore, this is a convex function. Okay, <clears throat> here uh, we have what uh, we had before, just more uh, elaborating. This is a convex function, uh, and there's a, a constraint that P is PSD. And since this is a convex function, when does we obtain the global minimizer? When the gradient is zero when the gradient which is written here is zero by the way if you are not familiar with uh, some differentiation with respect to uh, matrices and vector uh, there are, there are a book which is called uh, uh, mathematical coup or something like this if you can take a look there it's very comprehensive and it can help you to to look at it <clears throat> okay so this is a context for that what happens with least square when we open it we get the following uh, expression. And actually, the Hessian, as we said before, is always PSD. And the gradient is exactly the following gradient, right? And actually, since this, this is a convex function, the global optimizer is ob obtained when this is going to be 0, OK? And now, okay, so recall that this is going to be, uh, the global optimizer is obtained where this is going to be zero, right? That, now I would like to do two things. Would like to give to the least square uh, interpretation from the algebraic point of view and geometric point of view. And from the algebraic point of view, actually, if we have such, uh, a minimization problem, which is a least square problem. Actually, we can write it as the summation. This is norm, right? The summation of AI transpose X minus BI, where AI transpose is the highest row of the matrix A. Then actually, the objective is the sum of the square residual. We call this residual, okay? Uh, where the residual is the def definition of the residual is written here, AI transpose X minus BI. And actually, when we uh, minimize least square problem, we, mi we minimize sum of residuals, actually, which can be written in shorthand as Rx to the squared, OK? And uh, this problem is linear least squares. And, and you will see in the next lecture, we're going to have non-linear least square problem, which are going to be written exactly like this, okay? Such sum of the square residual. 
The reason it's called residual, residual is the remainder, remainder, and uh, the idea is that we want that the residual will be small as much as we can. And this is the name for this uh, <coughs> term. Okay. Uh, here in the top part of the slide, you see uh, the least square of something which is actually non-linear and does not resemble uh, this uh, uh, formulation, but it resembles in the sense that it's a least square, okay? Sum of sp uh, squared residuals, okay? <clears throat> so in the case of, uh, uh, of, the, of, sorry, in the case of least square, we have closed form solution. Uh, you are already, I guess, familiar with the normal equation because the uh, gradient is zero. Uh, uh, we have that this is going to be zero. These are called the normal equation. And under the assumption that A is full rank, we have a unique solution. In a minute, you will see what happens when A is not a full rank. And under the assumption we have this, because A is full rank, we can invert A transpose A and we have the unique solution. And why does it call normal equation? In a minute, you will see why. And the reason it's called normal equation is due to this geometric interpretation. So what we have here? We have here a matrix A consists of two columns in R3, one column and another column. This is the space spent by the column space of A, this plane. Okay? What does uh, least square A uh, uh, express, we would like to find, we have a, a vector B, which we know it, and generally it's not in the column space of A, but we would like to find a vector X star such that A X star is going to be in the column space of A, which be the closest point to the vector B. This means that we would like that A a x star minus b will be perpendicular to, le to the column space of a. This is the way that we get the closest point uh, to b, right? If we take this vertical, uh, I don't know, vertical vector, okay, to the column space. So this, I, this explains the normal equation from the other direction, not algebraic direction, in the sense that the difference between a x star minus b should be perpendicular to the column space of A, which means that if I'll take now A transpose and multiply it by b minus x star, it means that I take each column of A and uh, requires that it's going to be perpendicular to b minus x star, to the vector b minus x star, and I'm getting exactly the same equation that I got algebraically. Okay, this is exactly what we had before, the normal equation. And actually, uh, uh, <clears throat> the vector A star, which we call here B, is written like A times the solution to the equation. And if we look closely about this matrix P, you will see actually that P is a projection matrix, which means that P squared gives me against P, like uh, what we written here. So uh, uh, actually, A x star is the projection of B onto the column space of A. OK? This is the geometric interpretation. Um, what happens when uh, A is rank deficient, or it means that we have less rows than columns, for example, or we have the situation that rank of A is smaller than n when a is k times n. Then the null space is is uh, is is uh, it does not contain only the zero vector. Okay, so first of all, we still have the normal equations, but we cannot invert a transpose a since a is rank deficient. Anybody knows what we are going to do now? Do you have any? Somebody is familiar with this material? OK. <clears throat> Actually, it's uh, nice to understand that if I have a minimizer, 
to this uh, problem, since A is uh, rank deficient, any vector Z in the null space of A plus X is also in a minimizer, because if I'll take A times X plus Z, I'll get back A times X, since A times Z is zero. So there are infinite number of solutions. And uh, the idea is to find the one which has the smallest uh, norm between all the solutions. Um, actually, moreover, the set of all minimizers is going to be a convex set. <clears throat> and you can uh, understand it uh, immediately if you uh, if we define uh, the set of all minimizers to be all x's that gives the minimum um, in the sense that A is rank deficient, we have, as we saw before, we can have infinite number of solutions. Then uh, why is it convex? We take two solutions, which are minimizer, and lambda between 0 and 1. And we are going to look at the combination of lambda x1 plus lambda minus y minus lambda x2 would like to show this is also a minimizer. Why is it? So we, we plug it into A times the convex combination minus B. And due to the uh, uh, n n properties of norms, we have we, that we get lambda AX minus Y must be, Y minus lambda, so it's mistake here, should be without the lambda. Since this is a minimizer and this is a minimizer, we get back that we have the, mi the minimum of AX minus B. Therefore, lambda X1 plus la la Y minus lambda X2, which is a convex combination of X1 and X2, is also a minimizer. So we have uh, the optimal set is a convex set. We have many minimizers. Uh, and we would like, actually, to take a specific minimizer in this set. And I'm not going to show it, but I think you are familiar with it. Uh, and this is the, the claim that although the, this set uh, is a convex set and has many minimizer, there is just a unique element uh, in this set. Let's call it, for example, I don't know, uh, XLS like here. And this uh, unique minimizer uh, has uh, uh, is unique in the sense that it has the smallest norm, x itself, it has the smallest norm between all the minimizers. Okay? And the way to get this minimizer is to look at the SVD of the matrix A and to calculate the pseudo inference of the matrix A, which means that I'm taking the SVD of the matrix A and I'm keeping U and V as I have in matrix A. Actually, I'm inverting uh, uh, the diagonal matrix in the sense that each element in the new matrix is one over uh, the, the singular value that I had before, and the other are zero, if the rank of the matrix A is R. And then this uh, unique vector is actually uh, a, the pseudo inverse of A, which actually V times uh, uh, sigma inverted times U transpose times B, this is going to be the vector which is the uh, smallest uh, uh, norm and also it's the minimizer of the rank deficient least square problem. Actually, this generalizes the full rank problem and actually when you for example make the backslash uh, 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 operation in matlab you exactly get the pseudo inverse uh, in the case of rank deficient or what we had before in the case of the full rank okay just to know what, what is exactly uh, the idea of the pseudo inverse so i'm recapping this part and i'm going to move to uh, uh, in the time uh, we have uh, to uh, the idea of a line search method. So 
I have an unconstrained minimization problem. In general, the global minimizer is difficult to find, and we do not have the overall shape of the function. We have only local shape of f. Uh, there are special cases when f is constant, for example, that the global optimizer, even only if the gradient vanishes, like what we saw before. And the LS problem, we have a closed form solution. Uh, closed form solutions are rare. Uh, uh, and generally speaking, we are looking for algorithms that are looking for local minimizer. And especially we are looking for algorithms that are looking for the, the first order necessary condition, which means that we're looking for algorithms that such that the gradient vanishes at some point. Okay. So I'm moving on to uh, such algorithms. I'll talk in particular on the a, a steepened descent uh, algorithm or gradient descent algorithm. And then later on in the next uh, lecture, when Arnon is going to speak about uh, um, uh, the uh, bundle adjustment objective, he will speak about more sophisticated uh, algorithms. Um, so, what is the line search method before of all? So, this is an iterative method for an unconstrained optimization problem. <clears throat> That's what you are going to, we would like to minimize. We start with some x0 and would like to make, to make a move, new move, xk plus 1, such that it consists of what I have now plus some constant times some direction, um, such that the new iteration will give me a value which is smaller than what I have 1. The direction is choose that such that I'm in the direction of a, a descent direction, a search direction, which is a, a, a descent direction, which, which are going to be have a lower value in the function. And the step size uh, can be uh, cho chosen very uh, wisely and sophisticated. But the main idea of the step size is such that I'm looking at some uh, uh, one-dimensional profile of the function, and I'm trying to minimize the step size such that I'm going to, then, to have the minimum value of the function of xk in the direction of pk such this is going to be a very small value, going to be the smallest value. Actually, in practice, we do not know how to solve it accurately, but there are very kind of heuristics and more than heuristic, it's called Wolfe condition and other, that uh, um, shows how to find wisely the, 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 the step length. Uh, we are not going to deal it in this course. Uh, we are going mainly uh, to look at the direction, how to choose the direction. And <clears throat> we're going to see uh, uh, the next uh, formulation. Okay. So this is called line search method, OK? <clears throat> so the steepest descent direction, as all of you know, is the minus of the gradient. Record that the gradient is perpendicular to the level set of the function. Why it decreases rapidly in this direction? I guess you already are familiar with it, just to everybody will be on the same page. Um, so we look at the directional derivative of f along the direction p. This is the directional derivative, p transpose gradient of f at xk. And now I'm at iterate k, I'm asking well, myself, how should I go in what direction? And actually, I would like to get the most rapid decrease in the function, OK? So I would like to understand uh, which direction p to take, such that the unit it is a unit direction, such that this will be the smallest one, okay? And the answer is, since we have the relation between uh, p and the gradient, such that the inner product between them is the norm of p, which is 1, times the norm of the gradient, <coughs> times cosinus theta. Therefore, <coughs> the idea is, that the smallest direction, since cosinus theta can be be between minus 1 and 1, it's clear that when I'm taking cosinus theta to be minus 1, 
<clears throat> I'm uh, minimizing this quantity. And this means actually that I'm in the opposite direction to the gradient, which means that I'm, the, I'm, I'm in the direction of the minus gradient, actually divided by the norm of the gradient. <clears throat> okay? This is the reason why the, the, this direction is the steepest descent direction. Okay? I'm sure you saw it in the other courses and you're familiar with it. This is an example how uh, things behave when I'm taking this direction and moving uh, in such, for example, a convex function. Okay. Uh, this is inexpensive to compute, but sometimes it can be very slow. In a minute, we'll see how, when it is slow. Um, let, let me skip this uh, uh, slide because it's just repeating what I had before. Um, actually, uh, uh, a key property that uh, a, a line search method will converge is such that, related to what we had before, that the direction of the, of the, of the, of the search, PK, will be always with a uh, um, acute angle with respect to the minus gradient, which means I cannot move this uh, nine degrees, uh, 90 degrees of freedom. It should be here or here, okay? Not in, uh, in, in other direction, okay? Uh, which means that uh, the, the, the angle between minus the gradient and the direction that I'm choosing should be always between uh, uh, zero and one, and one, which means that the end angle should be acute, chada, between the minus gradient and the direction. Okay. This is Han Bin a critical issue uh, in convergence. Okay. Um, so if I want to analyze the steepest descent algorithm, I want to analyze the, the convergence of it. I want to analyze the following situation. I'm starting with the point, I'm taking uh, this direction, and let's say that I have some a step size such that uh, f is at the next iteration is smaller than f in the, in the right, in the current iteration. And we make this following update, okay? P is the direction, alpha is the step. And for example, we stop when the gradient is relatively small. This is good uh, situation. So what happens? So for, first of all, let's analyze strictly convex quadratic function. So if I have a, a strictly convex quad, quadratic function such that the Hessian is strictly greater than strictly positive definite, and this is the gradient, and apply, and apply a steeper descent in this direction, in the direction of minus of the gradient, and I uh, take uh, the step length that can be calculated in this case analytically to give me the smallest reduction in the function. I'm not going to, uh, uh, to describe it, just I'm writing it here. Then it can be shown, okay, that uh, when I'm doing exact line search to the strongly convex, convex quadratic function, let's see what the error norm satisfies. Actually, uh, uh, it satisfies that uh, x k plus one in the next iteration uh, minus the uh, global optimizer, okay, is smaller than some quantity, which we will analyze, analyze one times what I had before, okay? Um, and what is this quantity? If I take q and I'll uh, take the spectrum of q, lambda one till lambda n, then this quantity depends on the smallest eigenvalue of, of Q and the largest eigenvalue of Q. Okay, that's what we written here. So actually, um, this is lambda n minus lambda one divided by the summation of them squared. Um, and now I would like to ask a question, when the convergence will be faster? When lambda n is much smaller than lambda, so it was lambda one is much smaller than lambda n, or when lambda one is approximately close to lambda n. Let's see. If all the eigenvalues are the same, what I get here, 
if all eigenvalues are the same. Zero. We get zero. zero. We get zero. So if all eigenvalues are the same, we immediately converge to what we want. Now, if lambda n is much, much larger than lambda 1, then lambda 1 can be omitted from here and here. And then they'll get something which is approximately 1. And then the convergence is very, very slow. slow. Right. All of this is related to what we have so uh, in the beginning of the course. It depends on the condition number of the matrix Q, which is lambda n divided by lambda 1. So if the condition number is very large, it's always greater or equal to 1, OK? If the condition number is very large, then the uh, convergence could be very slow. If the condition number is closer to 1, uh, then it could be very fast. For example, if I'll take something like uh, 3 and 1, uh, then I'll have uh, 2 divided by 4. It's half squared. It's going to be very good. So. If we denote the value of the function at the, opti of the, at the minimal point by p star, then it can be shown that uh, uh, the conversion behaves like a geometric series, like what we we written here. <clears throat> F at the iteration k minus the uh, uh, requested value is smaller than c to the power of k uh, times uh, what, what I had in the beginning minus the requested value. This is what I had in the beginning. And this is C. This is actually the same like what we have here, just dividing by lambda n in the denominator and the, the denominator and the denominator. And as you see, if, if kappa, if the condition number is very large, C is going to be very closer to 1. And then this, the convergence could be very slow. And if uh, the condition number is is uh, small. We had very will have very good convergence. Um, this is the explanation of the zigzag that you see. For example, what we had before, right? This is a function where the condition number is relatively large, and this is the reason that it comes to be convergence very slow at the end. Let's see another example. Actually, this is this example. This is a, a strongly uh, quadratic, uh, uh, strongly convex function. This is the function, and this is q. And actually, when is q is very large or very q is very small, I'll I'm going to have a very large condition number, which depends on gamma. It will, it will be very slow for gamma, which is greater than much than one or smaller than one. And that's what we have in this example. We start from this point, and then the converger is going to be very slow, like what you see here, because the factor that we had here is very, very closer to one. Convergence is very, very slow, like geometric series. If the factor is one over half, one over four, it would be very fast. OK. <clears throat> This was related to convex function, and actually, this behaving, we saw it on the quadratic function, but the, when the function is strongly convex, no matter if quadratic or not, the behavior is very similar to what we had before. Now, this is analysis for the case where the function is not necessarily convex, but I have the following uh, uh, um, uh, requirements. If I have some function which continuously differentiable, and I, I know that it converges to a stationary point, which I call x star, and I know that at this point, uh, the Hessian is strictly positive definite, then I have the same behavior that I have before, which means that at the iteration k plus 1, uh, I have the, the difference between the the value of the function minus the value of the function at the stationary point is smaller than r squared times what I have in the previous iteration. 
where r is similar to what we had before. And just for example, if the condition number is 800 and I start from fx1 equal to zero, and I would like to reach to fx star equal to, uh, sorry, to one, well, to, to reach to fx star equal to one, then after a thousand iteration, fx star would be only 0 .7, 0 .0 0 0.7. It will take much time to get one more digit of accuracy, another digit of accuracy. It takes a lot of time. Okay? This is the slowness of the steepest descent uh, method. Here are some more examples. Uh, by the way, the convergence that we spoke about is called a uh, linear convergence, wide linear, because we take uh, the plot of uh, the number of iteration and we take the log of the difference between the value of the function and the optimal value. And we, when we plot it, we get a linear line. Okay, this is the, the, the reason it's called linear convergence. There are, there are uh, convergence in the, for example, in the Newton method, the convergence could be also quadratic, not just linear, much faster. Okay. Um, so here are more examples. Uh, here are examples of a convex uh, function. Okay. And th this shows the number of iteration to reach to accuracy, which is uh, 10 to the minus five as the uh, function of the condition number. So uh, when gamma is very small or is very large, the condition number is quite high. And where in the, it's approximately uh, one, the condition number is reasonable. And to see how many iteration I need in order to get the same accuracy when the condition number is large, like here, and see how many iteration I, I need to take when it's, it's some order of magnitude, okay? And, uh, okay, this is the idea. This is case of non-convex non function. You see the zigzag here and the slowness here also. And I would like to conclude this part and to say a few final words, and that's all. So the steepest descent method is very simple to implement under some mild condition. In case of strongly convex function f, the steepest descent method converges to a point which is a global minimizer. Uh, and in the general case, it can have linear convergence, which is relatively slow. Uh, it, can, it behaves like geometric series. It depends on the condition numbers very heavily, like we saw before. Condition number of the uh, of the Hessian uh, at the point of convergence. And actually, I think we concluded all. Next 